Hello and welcome to Tiny Table Talks, the podcast about board games, PC games and all the grey matter in between. And what a podcast we have for you this week. We have Rob, we have Claire, we have Simon, we have a review of a quilt crafting puzzle, we have a review of some funky space Lego, and of course we have all the unhelpful reminders to ensure that Rob never forgets about his tiny tackle. At the at table, table, sorry. Uh, I meant table. Oh, this is awkward. Um, uh, oh, I'm just going to start the podcast. Okay, so our, our topic of discussion this week is potentially going to be quite a contentious one, given that we're the people that play board games with each other. But we are trying to establish which games we wish our friends liked more, and on the opposite side of that, which games we wish our friends liked less. So I think we'll start with Claire on this one. So why don't you give us a game that you wish your friends liked more? So I wish my friends liked Forbidden Island more. There's one friend in particular. Those of you who've listened to our first episode will know that Sam does not like uh, cooperative team games. And Sam refuses to play it, uh, which I find really annoying because I love it. This game, for those of you that don't know it, is a cooperative game that can be played with up to four players. They are trying to collect treasures while the island around them sinks. And the aim of the game is to get all the treasures before the island can sink. But they've got powers and the ability to shore up the island around them. If bits are lost to the sea, some people are good at swimming, some people have a helicopter licence, other people may need to be rescued by their teammates. So between you all, you have all the skills that you need to get safely off the island with the four treasures. It's got several different difficulty modes so that you can learn on the novice mode and it goes right up to the elite player, which is the most difficult to do. And I think this has got great replayability because the map is different every time you lay down the tiles. And it's very sad for me that we so rarely get to play it. And in fact, we get to play it so rarely that I don't believe Rob and Simon have ever even had a go because Sam has always been there to insist that we don't get it out. I'll I'll jump in there, Claire. No, we we have indeed. We played it together, and it was I think when you first bought it for Sam, so uh, some time ago now. And uh, I I totally agree with you. I think it's a fantastic game, similar to Pandemic, uh, if you've played that, where it's sort of that cooperative play against the map sort of style. And uh, yeah, no, I thought it was really really well balanced. I think we played two or three games maybe, and uh, each one we only just made it off the island. Um, I found it really exciting. Uh, I think it was an excellent evening. The games aren't too long. I, I thought it was a really, really good game. Would you go as far as to say you wish that Sam liked it more? Um, no, no, because now I know that he doesn't like it very much. It means that we can play it and I know that it'll irritate him. So uh, my thoughts are <laughs> we should just increase the amount that we play it and invite Sam along. Regardless of Sam. Indeed, yeah. Robbie's right. It is a lot like Pandemic. And my thoughts on Pandemic will be fairly clear to anyone who listens to the first episode of this show. And I still can't quite get my head round. Well, I, I just don't want to play games where the only thing I'm going to beat is the game. But it's so pleasing to beat the game. But, but is it? Because I've got no interest. I don't know who made the game. I don't know who designed it. I, I'm just beating a bit of cardboard. That doesn't interest me at all. That's not the reason I play games. Or well, it's not the reason I play board games, strictly speaking, because actually a, a computer game, that bothers me a lot less. But in a board game, you've got six people around the table. And one of the things I like about board games is watching everybody's reaction as you as you win or you lose or, you, you know, someone does a good move or someone does something really stupid and you point and laugh at them. So really just making other people feel bad is what you like. The interaction with people is the best thing about board games. And the interaction with people in Forbidden Island is pointless and futile. <laughs> That's brutal. Don't mention your words, mate. I do agree that I I think that the um the most unpredictable thing is a, is another human player, and so there's certainly been plenty of games where uh, I've looked at the game state on the board and been like, in in an adversarial game, and been like, well, you know, if I was Sam, I would be doing X, and uh, and then Sam does Y, and I sit there like, wow, I would I would not have done that as an example, <laughs> um, and that that sticks in your mind much much more than we beat all the things that was in the game that had no agency and were just there to to be a sort of challenge. Well, I get yeah. a different kind of satisfaction from teaming up with my friends to overcome something or even something like 
I guess wall climbing. It's not that I'm beating a person if I climb up a wall, but it's still really satisfying to get to the top or to coach a friend so that they get to the top. You don't have to beat yeah, someone. It's a, it's it's a good, good point. There is, it, it is only board games, I think, that this bothers me. And you're right, it wouldn't bother me in a sporting environment. It, wouldn't, it doesn't bother me in a PC game environment. For some reason in board games where they leave, or the board game designer have left the door open for for a mixture of quarterbacking and, and, and just four people sitting there chatting about what the next best move is as opposed to sort of independently thinking. I, yeah, got no interest in it. Doesn't, doesn't sell for me at all. Right, I think we should probably move away from uh, cooperative board games in a, in a permanent move, not just on this podcast, and ask Claire to let us know which game she wishes her friends liked less. The game that I wish that you would all like less is Ark, that computer game that you currently love. You take that back, missus. <laughs> I think that comes from a place because Claire doesn't have a computer that can run Ark, and that otherwise she'd be fully on board. Yeah. There is definitely a chance. Okay, uh, for anyone who doesn't know Ark, isn't familiar with it, I'm going to explain it in my own words before the boys can correct me. It's basically like The Sims, but for adults. You get to build your own home and adopt your own pets, but it's set in the Stone Age, so your home might be built of stone and your pets are going to be dinosaurs. And although... I can see that the guys get a lot of fun out of this game. I just wish that they'd spend a little bit less time playing it. You know, they go away and they say, we're going to review a certain number of board games for the podcast. And we come back at the end of the week and it turns out all anyone has done is shouting at Rob for killing their dinosaur. I just need to interrupt there because that particular incident um, has actually uh, been addressed within uh, the dino court and I was found thoroughly not guilty. Oh, were you really? In in a sham trial. By a jury of no peers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rob was found not guilty. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Uh, no, uh, that, that, that particular incident was entirely out of my hands. Um, it, essentially, we were being attacked by a particularly vicious wild dinosaur um, and my dinosaur, Steve, and I will admit, Daffid, yes, both gave their lives to defend uh, this this other dinosaur um and actually quite frankly it's a very sad time uh, that we should all be mourning for rather than throwing blame and accusation around would you like to hear the version of events that i heard um would it please the court <laughs> yeah the court actually insists on hearing both sides of the argument <laughs> <laughs> the version of events that i heard was that you were at home building a dino garage or something like that well sam and simon were off doing whatever they do in the bushes together. (laughs) Objection. (laughs) Not upheld. (laughs) And then um, I heard that Rob logged off um, and he didn't lock the dinosaurs up so that some carnivore came along and ate them. Oh, right. To be fair, you have put two incidents together. So this has happened more than once, Claire. That's what we're saying. Yeah. The the initial offence that Rob is charged with is that on one occasion when he decided he'd had enough arc for an evening, he logged out without doing anything to secure the dinosaurs or the little base or house we built. The first time that we knew that Rob had made this error was a message popping up on mine and Simon's screen saying one of our dinosaurs had been killed. And we thought, that's a bit odd. So I went back to find out what had gone on and found the dinosaur garage with the doors open, loads of dinosaurs wandering aimlessly around the woods, and the doors to all the houses open... Uh, and a large dinosaur going around slowly slaughtering whatever it whatever it fancied. Um, it was worth noting that in this situation, Rob's dinosaur was just wandering aimlessly around the woods and making no effort at all to defend anything. Um, now, don't speak ill of the dead, all right? Steve was a wonderful dinosaur <laughs> who came to a tragic end defending uh, defending the greater good. Now, um, I'd also just like to point out that some of our dinosaurs might have figured out how to open doors. <laughs> Really? I mean, I did see that documentary Jurassic Park. I'm pretty sure the raptor opened the door. Exactly right. Yeah, look at Jurassic Park. This is um... Excellent. right. Um, I- I'm going to suggest we move on because uh, I'm feeling very, very targeted right now. I think the worst part is that the, uh, the the extension to the garage that Rob was claiming to be building still hasn't been completed. <laughs> it is complete how dare you said the the, the 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 dino garage is is a wonderful piece of piece of engineering which you are refusing to use correctly um it has little bays so you can park your dinosaur appropriately and if you'd always be a little bit more considerate with how you park your dinosaurs it would have plenty of room and it'd be safe for everyone how do stone age men mark out the bays rob there's a door per bay 
Yeah, there's a door per bay. Oh. Is there? Is there enough? To, because there's like eight dinosaurs in there. There's not eight doors. Well, no, there are eight dinosaurs because you've gone out and just whimsically gone and tamed dinosaurs without checking with the engineer. We haven't tamed anything since you extended the dinosaur garage. It's also worth noting that I think you might be the only person on Earth who, when tasked with the job of extend the dinosaur garage so that the dinosaurs have somewhere safe to be, could kill two dinosaurs in that process. <laughs> <laughs> I've really enjoyed Ark since uh, since the last episode of the podcast. Um, you guys really sold it to me in that in that episode, and I've had a lot of fun playing it. It is excellent fun. I, I think we could probably talk about it for hours, and we potentially shouldn't. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll move us on. Uh, and ask Rob, do you want to give us a, a game that you wish your friends liked more? Yeah, uh, so the game I wish that, um, not not just this this particular group, but the, the friends in general, um, is a game that I started playing with uh, Sai a long time ago, when we first started sort of really getting into computer games, and that's Divinity Original Sin. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite funny you say that. I uninstalled that this week. Ah. Oh! You see, this is it. I, I wish that you liked it more. I don't dislike Divinity. I only uninstalled it because we don't play it. Well, if you liked so, it a bit more, you might instigate more games instead of Ark. I don't like it as much as Ark. If you're wondering, um, D- Divinity uh, Original Sin, it was released in 2014. It's a, it's a fantasy role-playing game that was developed by Larian Studios. Really, really good Good, good, fun game. Um, the depth of the RPG elements are uh, absolutely enormous. Uh, you can really sort of customise your character to the nth degree. Um, the narrative, as well as it's highly engaging, um, but also not too prescriptive. It's super flexible, isn't it? It is, yeah, super flexible. Yeah, you can sort of spend as long as you want in a particular area, or you can rush through it. Um, it is. It's it's a little prescriptive in insofar as the the uh, each map so there are five six maps and they get progressively more difficult the further you get through them so the first playthrough we did we sort of rushed through a little bit too far and then we we're just coming up against enemies that we just could not even begin to touch and we were just dying constantly we very nearly quit at that point actually didn't we we were very nearly sort of ready to throw it in but so fortunately so i did a bit of research and we went back a step and then sort of did a lot of the quests that we missed out uh leveled up the characters and um, we both got really, really engaged in the game and the narrative. Um, and I'm trying to think, so si, can you remember the game which caused us to stop playing it? Stellaris. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, Stellaris. Probably yeah. was Stellaris. The, the, the thing with Divinity is it is, it's a fantastic game. I think in co-op, it's a work of magic. Like, it's just so oh, seamless. Yes. Does Sam the co-op hater agree with that? Yeah, I, I think it's great, actually. I think it works really well. I, I particularly like the way that the combat is turn based but nothing else is mm. so you've got mm. freedom to do anything but there's still a structured way to deal with combat yeah it's very it's how i kind of imagine like a uh, dnd combat would be translated into uh into a video game in that everything's kind of based on uh range and movement and uh actions um but it, yeah, the, I mean, the way that the you can build the characters and the dynamic you can you can put between them definitely mean that you get quite engaged with, like, oh, you know, you're playing as the Red Prince and he's kind of like this big red lizard guy um, that can like is quite tanky and can you know have shields and, and and swords and stuff. But if you wanted to, you could completely rebuild that character and turn him into you know a, a mage that can shoot fire and things like that and and the game can just completely allow for that uh play style yeah um Uh, i think the other thing that's really cool about divinity 2 is the kind of interactions you can have with the environment so there might be a um a spell where you summon uh rain and then the floor will get covered in water and then if the enemies are stood (laughs) in it and you cast a lightning bolt on them they'll take additional damage or that water will, you know, the lightning will travel through the water and hit other other characters or your own characters. So it's not just, oh, I've got an enemy here and an enemy there and an enemy up on that ledge. You can kind of work all of those things together to, to uh, help you out or to hinder you. Yeah, it's been thought it through much more than most most of its competitors, I think. I think the the way that they've they've dealt with the sort of environment mechanics and and interaction mechanics is ahead of most games that i would consider it to be its competition definitely we should potentially move on rob do you want to give us a game you wish your friends liked less 
Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I found this question really difficult because I, I think on the whole, excluding uh, Sam from this, uh, we're all pretty open-minded when it comes to games. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but uh, the, the games, and so I, I extend this to our wider friendship circles as well. Uh, the games that I wished our friends liked less, uh, I have a whole genre of them. It's games uh, like those parlor games, Trivial Pursuits, Cranium, Double, that sort oh, of stuff. Oh, Trivial Pursuit can go away. Exactly. And do you know what is even worse than Trivial Pursuit? Themed Trivial Pursuit. Who wants to play Harry Potter Trivial Pursuit, for goodness sake? Oh, God. Um, I think I'd prefer um, that to the original. I will half defend this and say that I... No, stop it, Sam. No one wants to hear this defence. I'm not defending <laughs> Cranium, and I'm never going to defend Dobble, because Christ. But I like Trivial Pursuit as the base game. I like a quiz. I'm, I'm a fan of a pub quiz. I don't mind a quiz game. I'm, I'm okay with original Trivial Pursuit. On occasion, with the right group of friends, it's not its not really a board game by any definition that I've got. It's just doing a quiz, and I quite like a quiz. Themed Trivial Pursuit, particularly the, the Harry Potter-esque ones, yeah, no interest in that. None at all. The, what I really object to with the Trivial Pursuit, and I'm really sorry, Rob, because this is your thing, but now I feel so riled up about it <laughs> that I'm going to join in. <laughs> what I really object to is it's just a series of opportunities for you to prove that you don't know things. And yes. they ask you ridiculous questions like, where did Mel and Sue, who uh, were presented the Great British Bake Off in 2015, go to university? And you think, not only do I not know that, but I don't care that I don't Cambridge. know that. Yeah, that did turn out to be the answer. I think this might be um, a, <laughs> more, more of a window into my upbringing than anything else. But uh, yeah, I was raised um, playing Trivial Pursuit uh, with my family. And, uh, you know, it was like the 1980s version. So it was sort of, you know, which uh, yeah. cricket captain Unplayable. won yeah. the 1980s. Uh, and of course, my dad knew every single one. And I was sat there as a child being like, I didn't even know. Cricket was a thing. There was a cricket captain. Yeah, in, in the 80s. What? what? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I know they've released more modern versions. They've also released kids versions. Um, and maybe I'd enjoy playing the kids version because that's sort of more my intellectual level. But uh, yeah, certainly if I had the choice between um, playing Trivial Pursuit and, uh, you know, like burning myself, I'd probably choose choose the latter. <laughs> I think of all the funny parlour games, I think Trivial Pursuit is probably the one that I would pick to play. If you said, you know, do you want to play Dobble? Do you want to play Cranium? Do you want to play Trivial Pursuit? I, th- I think I would pick Trivial Pursuit because cra- Cranium's too silly for me. I've got, just got no interest in it. It's, it's just it's making a fool of yourself. And apparently it's fun, and I don't, I don't really get it. Um, and doubles, <laughs> doubles barely a game. It's just colourful snap. It's just ugh, pointless. Um, so I think I'd probably prefer to play Trivial Pursuit if I had to pick between them three. But that said, I don't think that all parlour games are awful. Like Articulate, for example, I would describe as a parlour game, and that's really good fun. I love Articulate. Mm. Yeah, I'm yeah, a fan. I really I'd also say that um, the, the the other game that very nearly didn't make me say parlour games was Fibbage, which I've had oh, so many uh, good nights yeah. playing. That's great. The, the Jackbox party packages you can buy on, on Steam, or presumably you can buy them elsewhere. I don't know, I've, I've got them through Steam. Are, are brilliant. They're not very expensive. They're hours and hours of fun. I can't really recommend them highly enough. Actually, I think they're they're fantastic. I would say that the the existence of those just completely, uh, you know, null, null and void your Trivial Pursuit or your Pictionary or your Cranium because yeah, much more the, fun. The Jackbox yeah, games are, in, are are much much better. And interestingly, I think they've seen quite an uptick in their uh, their lease of life over this lockdown period i'm sure they have yeah yeah perhaps, perhaps rather than explaining fibbage to our audience perhaps we should just say uh, just yeah search in steam uh, or probably just on the internet for jackbox games um download a few yeah they're, they're not a lot of money um basically you'll need a mobile phone and a laptop um and, and it doesn't need to be a powerful a laptop in any way shape or form no no it doesn't the, the other good thing about these chatbot games is that they're excellent when you play them with a big group all sat in your living room and you're all having a drink they're they're great fun but you can play them remotely over zoom and have almost as much of a laugh so uh, if you're separated from people at the moment or you can't have a certain amount of people in your front room then uh, they're perfect for that i think we should do a whole piece on the jackbox games in a future podcast yeah, on, on, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, right. Should we should we move on, well, Simon? Let's uh, let's go around to you. Do you want to give us a game that 
you wish your friends liked more? I, it's not a specific game. I've gone for a genre, um, and it's not a board game. It's the, the Battle Royale genre. Um, so most recently, we've been playing a little bit of Call of Duty Warzone, which is a uh, a free to play battle royale game. Um, what is a battle royale? I'm glad you asked, Claire, because I prepared for my section. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a battle royale game is is where um, uh, players compete in a continuously shrinking map to be the last man standing or the last player remaining. The map shrinks. So yeah, so in in Warzone, um, 150 people of of in a variety of different team sizes. Uh, all parachute into a large map uh, and when you encounter other players you you will you would fight them and you're fighting to be the last sort of person standing Um, so as the game progresses and as more and more people are eliminated uh, the area of the map in which you're safely able to move around begins to shrink Um, so what that does is eventually very sensible yeah, so instead of having 150 people and, and you're on this ginormous map and, and no one you know ever moves and no one can find each other, eventually what happens is uh, you kind of force the remaining players into tighter and tighter confines until there's a, an ultimate uh, victor. I really enjoy that. Like, I find this, uh, like, it's a very high tension kind of game mode because you've you've got kind of one life um, and, and very limited ways of, of getting back if you're, if you're killed. Um, the kind of stress and the strategy and the tactical kind of I'm going to move to this building because the map's about to shrink and if I'm get if I get caught out of that then that will kill me. Um, but I know that there's going to be someone in this window. But you, you like once you've played the game enough, you start to get this real kind of sixth sense about how how uh, how certain actions that you take are going to impact other people around you. Um, Can you die when the map shrinks on you? Yeah, so if you're caught outside of the the sort of new playable area, it it will uh, it will kill you. So that's obviously there to. Um, that's such an inglorious way to go. It is, well, it is, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but that that adds to like that level of gameplay in that you have to look at okay, well, the map's going to shrink, and I'm I'm in the middle of the area that's about to become unplayable. So part of your then decision making is how do I most safely and most securely make it to a where you know an area of the map that's going to be safer and you have to think about other people will be having the same questions and you know that there'll be someone somewhere on the top of a roof in the safe zone looking out into the bit that's about to become unplayable trying oh, to pick people yeah. off. So there's a lot of sort of uh things that that you have to think about and that are very strategic when you're playing it. Um, the other thing that's quite important in these kind of games is that when you drop into this map, you're basically unequipped. So you have no, uh, like, you have either very basic weapon or no weapons, um, or and you have no health items, no armor, nothing like that. And you have to then move around the map collecting these things. So that's another incentive to to get people to run into each other because they're both looking for, you know, more armor or, or a better gun. Frankly, I think that now you've described it in those glowing terms, your friends will be more inclined to play it with you. So, that sounds great. Well, so I was, well, I, 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 I'll invite them to, to, <laughs> to add their thing. I So I've been playing a lot of Warzone uh, recently in the solo version, which means that uh, it's just me and all the other 150 people in the map are just single players there's no teams uh, to help each other out and that is fun but it does slightly in my experience engender quite a cautious and kind of passive uh gameplay uh you get a lot of people I just that don't are... understand how this scenario can work with passive gameplay it sounds like this violence is the only strategy that's ap- that's applicable. that's true but i think that it kind of uh, it encourages people to play very very safely as safely as they can because they only have themselves to rely on so you'll find a lot of people uh in the sort of safe area of the map um just hiding at the top of a building and you might not you'd have no idea they're there and you you walk up the ladder and and they shoot you and you're dead and you're like well that's quite frustrating because there's not there even I mean, in some scenarios you could you could have expected that but it's 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 difficult um when you play with other people um i have played a few times with with some people that i know uh, that aren't uh, rob and sam um you know other people than us yeah i have other friends how much do you pay them <laughs> <laughs> quite expensive that's why i've only played a few games with them 
it, it, so once you play with with more people uh you can you can play a lot more actively a lot more aggressively because the uh downsides of getting shot there there's like they can revive you they can bring you back into the game it makes it a lot more um forgiving especially in warzone and therefore um you can play in a much more sort of active and aggressive way which i find um like it's it's really fun it's really engaging i think the problem that I think Sam and Rob are probably uh, about to jump in and say is that for me the learning curve of of a battle royale game is extremely steep, um, and it's not very it's not very fun when you are starting a game. It takes a few minutes to get into the game. You land and you're just instantly gunned down by someone who's played it a hundred hours more than you. Yeah, that that's where I was going to cite it because I I don't mind spawning in and getting killed because. Let's face it, I'm really bad at the game. Um, but what irritates me is is the loading times. Um, and again, I've spoken before about being a product of my generation. But man, I need constant entertainment, okay? And if you, as you say, spend a good period of time going into the game, because we should also probably say that it is a massive game. Oh, it's a, it's obscene. It's a big game. Yeah, it's a massive game. Uh, it's it's over 100 gigabytes. And uh, bear in mind, I've got a fairly decent PC. Uh, my PC struggles to run it sometimes. Um, not not to the point where I'm having crashes, but uh, the loading times are pretty elongated. It's crazy, though, because I'm playing on... Uh, so one of the reasons that we picked this game up is because uh, it, it provides cross-play between playstation pc xbox any of those combinations and, and we wanted to play with a friend of ours who only has a playstation but what, what's crazy to me is that playing on a playstation it's pretty stable and it's pretty smooth and those ps4s are definitely less powerful than your p be either of yours pcs does anyone have an advantage is it better for people playing on playstations or computers who does the best i mean i think i, th- I think the overall internet would say that if you play on a mouse and keyboard you have an advantage um depending on how comfortable you are with playing on mouse and keyboard. Um, that has not been my experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there might be something down to the uh, the the operator there. I think the problem I have with, uh, particularly Warzone, not, not so much all the Battle Royale games, because I haven't played a huge amount, but Warzone in particular, is that, it, it, as, as Simon and, and Rob alluded to, I'm crap at this game. And when we play it as a group, I always ask to, or we, I try and push us to play in a in a mode where you can just respawn when you die mm. because having a single life it makes the game unenjoyable for me i'm just i'm just not good enough uh, i die quickly and then there's nothing else i can do i totally agree with you sam i prefer that game mode because i, I think it promotes more whimsical gameplay I, yeah. I, whimsical probably isn't the right word there but <laughs> i agree you take more risks don't you because it's a bit less consequential yeah. and, and the other thing is i'm not you know i'm probably 100 hours or something off being good enough to play on that battle royale mode and enjoy it and i'm not willing to do that and i totally totally understand that but when you get over that learning curve and you like i've 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 played games where it's just it's been so intense that when the game's finished I've had to just like take a break because like <laughs> my heart was like beating like your hands start sweating because you know that you you know you, you know the story of the, the journey that you've been on through that game and when you're suddenly the final sort of 10 five people you're like I've got a real shot at doing this uh, it's very intense I, and I I thoroughly enjoy that but I've played a lot of battle royale games and so I think that learning curve from jumping from one to the other to the other is a lot lot smaller than it would be for someone that's never experienced those kind of games before never played them before i'm gonna move us on because we're running well over time as as always simon do you want to tell us about a game that you wish your friends liked less yeah so i struggled with this because as as kind of rob said i'm i'm generally pretty happy to play anything especially if it's with some friends because it's hard enough to find friends that share a hobby with you let alone then getting picky (laughs) into a well, actually, I don't like that type of thing. But um, I think the game that I've least enjoyed us all playing uh, is is Hearts of Iron 4. And I'm sure I can hear Matt already screaming at his, his phone. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can hear him from all the way across the county border just bellowing. Yeah, so Hearts of Iron is a, is a paradox grand strategy game set in, in World War II uh, or, or the, the years preceding and... and um, before and after world war ii uh you 
take on a country so you could be the ally you could be you know britain or germany or the us or you know turkey and it's got all all the countries you could think of big or small um and then you have to try and guide them uh through the the sort of events of the war uh, and, and as part of that you are you're building armies building navies building air force um you are um kind of going down the sort of political tree so um what's really interesting about the game is that it's quite a fun sandbox to go into kind of alternative history uh scenarios uh and you can actually specifically set the game mode to try uh, to to not try and follow what actually accurately happened and so you can end up with like communist france uh joining with the soviets and things like that which is quite entertaining um i'm not unfamiliar with paradox grand strategy games like i've I've played a lot of stellaris um i've played a little bit of crusader kings 2 um so some of the the way that you you interact with hearts of iron is quite familiar to me but the thing that really kills it is it it's it's just not very fun to actually play like the the actual moments or like actions of moving your armies and and navies and air force and stuff are just so obscure and so illogical <laughs> that i just honestly can't begin to understand how you can uh, like how you can put any anything together um and the game does such a terrible job of explaining any of that and that, um, in, a, in a game about war i find that kind of unforgiving yeah, I, I, I will agree with you on this. I think I object to Hearts of Iron less than you do, Simon, but I think potentially that's because I I get caught up in the, the in narrative. The but this is one of the times yeah. where I think I, I like the, the the actual story behind the game, which is it's quite a rarity, actually. Um, and I think that that's made me forgive certain flaws with the game. But you are right. It, it, it's a first criticism. It, it tells you absolutely nothing about how to play the game. And a, a bigger complaint I think I have with Hearts of Iron is... And this brings me on actually to the game that I wish people liked less, which is which is Stellaris. So we're, we're back on the, uh, the the paradox problems. And the issue I have with the, the paradox grand strategy games, particularly these two. So paradox is the developer of Stellaris and of Hearts of Iron. They specialize in grand strategy kind of big sprawling games. They do. They specialize in grand strategy games, and they specialize in putting in unnecessary administration into all the games that they seem to produce. And it, they, they do the same with Hearts of Iron as they do with Stellaris. I think it's probably worse in Stellaris, but it's not good in either. Is they, they they produce things that you have to govern, which means that you can realistically spend a whole evening, a whole day playing Stellaris or, or Hearts of Iron to a lesser extent, but certainly Stellaris, just doing admin, doing nothing but admin. And there's no fun in it. What kind of admin? Is there an exciting admin? I don't know. Settlers is all about admin and it's quite fun. As a crossover between the two games, there's consumer goods apply to both both games, which is effectively what the populace needs to, to survive. To stay to, happy. To yeah. stay happy and various other bits. Um, but of course, you need to have the right... Re- In Stellaris, you have to get the right resources to be able to produce them. And of course, producing their resources needs more people to to do them and then you need to, to produce them and then you need more consumer goods to pay for the people to produce the things to produce the consumer goods so you spend the whole time doing this pointless balancing act alongside an economy that you need to balance which is utterly pointless as well it, it's I, I can understand that there needs to be an economy and, and that potentially people are buying things from a market that the prices are going to change a bit and that adds a, an element to it but the unnecessary amount of admin involved in Solaris it takes away all the fun of the game you can you can spend evenings or days playing it and just do nothing interesting you can just you you don't invade anyone you don't do anything you just spend the whole time clicking around trying to work out whether you've got enough minerals i think the weirdest thing i can see would be and and what i think would fix this is actually a hybrid of the two in that i actually find the economic part of hearts of iron it was frustrating at first but it's certainly much less frustrating than in stellaris and is a lot is a lot clearer you basically just build factories and the factories either make military goods or they make consumer goods and that's pretty much as complicated as it gets um whereas 
in Stellaris, yes, it feels like you're trying to keep about 12 plates spinning to try and keep everything in the, yeah. in you know net positive. Uh, and You've convinced me that both games sound rubbish. What I was going to say is that... Um, if you if you took the Hearts of Iron approach, the econo- economics, and applied it to Stellaris, I feel like you would have the best of both worlds. Because what I really like about Stellaris is that the combat is extremely clear. Um, the management of your armies and your fleets and things like that make perfect sense to me. And I think if you just put them in front of anyone, once you told them how to build you know, a fleet, they could probably pretty much figure out, okay, I can take the fleet and I can put it here. And if it's in here and another fleet comes, they're going to fight each other straightforward. Whereas in Hearts of Iron, oh my God, I don't, I, on, to this day, I don't think I could, I could uh, competently perform even the most basic of attack actions in that game. And this is despite, in, despite in one game, I spent the entirety of the evening just focusing on my navy. And I was like, right, I'm going to have a great navy. Um, I'm going to have, you know, a load of battleships, a load of aircraft carriers. Um, and and as soon as the war broke out, I just I just I just wanted to click them into the sea. Like I was like, just go to this bit of sea. And even that was just completely obscure. <laughs> the ships are particularly bad in Hearts of Iron. They for some reason they just seem to have made that unnecessarily complicated to do basic things with but i would argue that the same the same applies to the air force which is which is a little bit more intuitive but a bit still still unnecessarily tricky and the ground movements though they do sort of make sense in how they work the actual interface with the person who's controlling them is ridiculous and i don't think you often get realistic outcomes Mm. Uh, and i i've certainly laid out attacks before on hearts of iron where I've I've laid out various sorts of manoeuvres and I've timed how it, how I want everybody to move and when they want them to move. I put particular units in certain areas to do particular manoeuvres, and I've laid out a battle plan. Which, due to my levels of boredom and, and spending my whole life reading military history books, I'm certain was correct. Like I, I would not be told that the battle plan that I put in on a few occasions was incorrect and destined to fail. And yet, on at least two of them occasions, I was just rolled back into the sea in a way that. I cannot understand. And the, the game gives you no inclination as to why you've been rolled back into the sea. You just are. Can I ask Rob, because these games sound dreadful so far, but I know that Rob loves Stellaris and has spent an enormous proportion of his life playing it. Rob, what have you got to say in defence of these games? Uh, yeah, no, I have. So um, I really enjoyed Hearts of Iron when we, when we played it. Um, and as we all know, I enjoy Stellaris. Uh, I certainly enjoyed Hearts of Iron less. Uh, for me, it came down to one simple thing, which was the user interface. Uh, the UI, I think, is really inaccessible. Um, the game doesn't do what it, you, you think it's going to do. And, and I know Stellaris, Stellaris is guilty of that as well, but uh, it's just things like... So I, I played a game with uh, Sam, and I was playing Japan, and uh, basically we decided to take on Russia, which if you ever play hearts of iron Uh, don't do that it's a really really bad idea but we thought we'd do it anyway and um basically russia were winning the the battle against me which is to be expected and that made total sense so i thought fine okay what i'm going to do is i'm going to order a retreat so i thought i'd pull all of my troops back uh to a narrower point uh in the country which would mean allow me to defend it better um now to actually queue up all of those orders is really really tricky uh, for various reasons uh, you end up with like uh, so, so okay i need to go back a step so to, to draw like a front line basically you right click on the country and then drag it where you want your troops to defend basically but the issue is is that if you draw new front lines it doesn't get rid of the old front lines and you end up with like little bits of front line everywhere which you can't really see the user interface doesn't really show them all that well so when I drew my defensive line, my treat line, basically some of my troops retreated back to that line, but the rest of them just sort of stood where they are and sort of wandered around the country a little bit and then got totally cut off. And I went from having, uh, I think it was something like 48 divisions, which is a lot within this game, to having three, simply because the majority of my army went to go and defend some small spit of land where I'd forgotten to remove a battle line. Now, I, I think you could blame that on the user uh, and say actually no I should have just prepared and checked better uh, my, my argument would be that um, it should show it better for you because doing a little bit any like of Stellaris, the things you just described uh, it's clear as mud 
in that game yeah, how to yeah, do yeah, any you're of that. completely right it, it gives you no inclination I, I, there probably is a tutorial on there somewhere but even that isn't like it's not blatantly obvious when you open the game where the tutorial is if there is one at all yeah and it, at least in Stellaris, you do get a little kind of pop up that says every time you click on a new screen, it will give you an, a you know breakdown of what that screen shows you and 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 what it relates to, and you can kind of engage with that as as much as you like. Having um, read a little bit online about this, because I wanted to like Hearts of Iron a lot, and I think for a little while I did, I was I was sort of got a bit caught up, and I was willing to forgive its flaws, and I still do quite like it. I would still play Hearts of Iron, but. One of the things I notice when you go online and you try and look in for a bit of advice about this is they say, well, you know, it takes a little while, but, but, you know, wars do take a little while. So just pause the game, do all the bits you need to do, and then unpause the game and blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. On my single player, I did that. And you pause the game, you do every bit you need to do, and then you play a bit more when you pause it and you do a bit more. And it sort of, that works. It's a bit clunky as a way of working, but but it sort of functions. When you're playing four or five, even two players in the same game, you can't really do that because the game will never move on because everyone will always need to pause at some point. And I don't think that's, I don't think that, oh, you can pause the game is a, it is, is a valid argument for why your game has 200,000 variables that can't be easily controlled. Just to offer, I suppose, a point of defence for it, because I'm very aware, Claire, that you asked me to defend it, and then I continued to later. Yeah, I did notice that. Yeah. <laughs> um, just, just to offer we all a wish we wouldn't play it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't sound like a game we're going to give much more time to. Um, it just uh, So uh, Matt is a, a really good friend of ours. He uh, absolutely sort of loves this game. And just to take something which he said, which I think uh, was a really, really good point. Um, when you had that first game, I remember when we played, first played um, all four of us. And uh, Sai, you just had that the worst game where you didn't feel like you were doing anything useful. You didn't really understand how anything worked. And as far as you were concerned, you just lost three hours of your life. Um Matt did put it quite well, which was we were playing countries which were quite small because the smaller countries are easier to manage when you first play. So um, I can't remember what we were playing, but maybe I think we were playing I think I was Norway U- I was Yugoslavia, Sweden. I think. Yugoslavia. Yeah, you were, okay, you were yeah. Turkey, Rob. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was playing Turkey, yeah. Um, Matt did put it quite rightly, which is that, you know, you're not going to win World War Two playing as one of these countries. That's just not how it works. Uh, and actually, point. to put to have a game where you can play as a country knowing full well that you're never going to win this war and that actually, you know, the way in which you're going to progress is not through military prowess. Yes, it is important, but actually it's going to be through diplomacy and getting people on your side and your political stance. I think that's a really, really interesting mechanic because even with Stellaris, even if you play as um, the pacifist uh, race, for example, who can't wage war, you can still win the game relatively easily you can build up a big enough fleet and wait for people to attack you and then at which point you can attack them and win over so i think that's something this this game does really well Uh, and you know you need to accept the fact that i'm never going to build up a navy uh, an army or an air force which is big enough to take on germany so i need to think about other ways to to win Uh, and i I think it does create very uh, it requires creative gameplay yeah okay okay so i'm going to move us on to the games we've been reviewing this week so Myself and Claire have been reviewing Patchwork, which is a, a small Euro game, and Rob and Simon have been reviewing Space Engineers. So I think we'll start with Patchwork. So Claire, do you want to give us a, or we'll give, give the listeners a, an idea of what Patchwork is? Yeah, so Patchwork's a game in which players compete to make the best patchwork quilt, which I think you'll agree is one of the most unique... I'm already excited. Yeah, you've never played a board game with a theme like that before, have you? And I'm pretty sure there will never be another one. The reasons why I think people will love it is that it's we've played it, we don't usually like Euro games, but this is our favourite Euro game, so well worth considering, even if you're usually a bit cautious of them. It works, the players move around the board and each turn you have the opportunity to buy a piece of fabric to go on your patchwork quilt. The currency is buttons instead of money, uh, which I think is quite cute. One of the other limited factors as well is that you have to be able to fit the pieces on your board. So you've got your own little nine times nine board and you want to try and fit all the shapes on it. In addition to this nine times nine board that you're trying to fill, actually there's a set of bonus points that go to the first person to fill a seven times seven grid of their quilt. So even before the points are counted at the end, you can get a little bonus card. Um, But ultimately, you're trying to fill as much of the nine times nine grid as possible. 
And Sam and I, while we were reviewing and practicing this game, were absolutely fascinated by the tactics of it. It sounds really simple, but uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. So we played this game repeatedly in our lunch hours, um, trying to <laughs> trying to work out the winning strategy, trying to get one up on each other. Um, to be honest, it took me two games to realise that all the pieces were double-sided and I could flip them over, so that was a big step forward. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Um, so, for example, Sam went um, for the 7 times 7 square. I think that's the obvious tactic to go for at the beginning. Um, and when he did that ahead of me, I thought that the game was largely over for me, but there was definitely no reason for me to fill up my 7 times 7 grid. So I focused on the end game, which is 9 times 9. And although I didn't get those bonus points, um, I could fill my square more easily because... If you think about, if you've filled up a 7x7 square on a 9x9 grid, then you've got a very small margin around the edges where you can slot other pieces into. But it was much easier for me because um, I I hadn't got that those small corners left to fill. So I could, uh, yeah, I had a lot more freedom and I won. Very close. Um, and Claire, the pieces of patchwork you pick up, are they? I assume it's kind of like Tetris in that they're all different shapes and so... Very yes, context. that's exactly yeah. it. Everyone is a different shape. And also, pleasingly, everyone is a different colour and pattern. So you, if the piece goes that you wanted, that's not coming back. You've just got to change the strategy. I think what I like about Patchwork is the you can have all these different tactics. I mean, we played four games and we drew in the end. We won one, two each. And I think we were consistently trying different different tactics and various other things. And you can sort of... You can always see where your tactic falls flat, but always a little bit too late to do anything about it. But it does mean that because the games are quite short, you can you can sort of have a go at a game and think, you know, maybe I'll try this this time, I'll try this this time. And it will still be fun, unlike some other games where I think if you try a tactic, it doesn't go very well. You feel like you've wasted your time. That patchwork doesn't mm. do that. I think one of the things that patchwork does, which is particularly good, is unlike Splendor, where the, the theme of the, the game just doesn't exist, that, that it pretends to be about being a gem merchant, and to be honest, you just do everything between green, black, white, and blue, and the actual thematic side of the game just disappears. Patchwork's the opposite of that. The theme actually sticks with it, and the theme, which actually sounds like it's not, not much fun, it is quite a lot of fun. And this sort of weird economic Tetris is surprisingly engaging. I, I was I was really impressed with Patchwork. I thought it was great. I have a question. I think one of the, the things that really annoyed me about Splendor last time was the fact that at the beginning of the game, it felt very slow. And then by the end of the game, you felt like you were being cut short. Like you, you were building this engine and it and it, it by the time it was ready to go, the game was over. It, it doesn't sound like this game suffers from that, despite it being like a Euro game where you are trying to sort of improve your your standings each turn because time in splendor you don't know when it's going to run out so you always feel a bit disappointed when you're cut down but time in patchwork is one of the dynamics that you have to balance into your strategy so you can see when it's running out and you can control it to a, a certain extent and if it runs out before you're ready that's a reflection on you and your tactics which you can adjust for the next game so it doesn't leave you feeling quite so bitter yeah, so the, the, the board in the middle, which is, so effectively you've got two game boards, so you've got the, the game that the, the board that you use where you build your own quilt, and then there's a board in the middle, which is the timer. It's like a spiral timer, and as you go mm. along, there's various things that happen on it, like you might get a little extra patch, or you'll get some you'll, you'll instigate a count of the buttons that you get, so you get more buttons. And it's very visible. You can all see how the time is going and how far you are, and you can see how many times you're going to be able to do another button count or how many little extra patches you could get on your, on your way around. So the amount of time you have is quite visible, so you can plan around the time of the game, because the game will end at the same point every time. Unlike Splendor, where someone might just end the game, Patchwork doesn't allow you to do that. The game will end when everyone gets to the end of the timer, which means you can pace yourself with your, with your building of your quilt. We'll post a picture to our Twitter account, at Tiny Table Pod, so that you can see what the board looks like. And... Uh... How much is patchwork? Is it like how many pints am I giving up to to be a seamstress? So patchwork's a little bit cheaper than Splendor, if I remember the price of Splendor correctly. Patchwork is currently on Amazon for twenty three pounds, and I would say for what should we say that is four and a half pints, four and a bit pints. Yeah, yeah. 
I would say for four, four and a bit pints, it's it's worth having. I, I would I would rather have a copy of Patchwork. I think it's a fun thing to own. Um, and I think it's very accessible. I think you could play this with a, a wide range of people. I would expect your fiancé or, or your wife, Simon and Rob, to be perfectly happy playing Patchwork. And I think they'd enjoy playing it with you. Um, but I also think that there's enough sort of tactical nuance in it that you could play it with two more serious board gamers and and both have a have a good time there's a couple of other comments worth uh this particular group knowing firstly you can play patchwork on a tiny table it does not require much space so if you happen to be rob you can own it secondly you cannot play this game satisfactorily with someone who takes forever to take their move i think it would drive you absolutely crackers so sorry simon it's out. I do think you'd both enjoy it. No, I, th- I really like the sound of it. I might, I, uh, I might get it. So there we go. Patchwork, a uh, fun and thematic Euro game. So to move on, we will speak to Simon and Rob about space engineers. T- tell us about your, your space building antics, chaps. Right. So space engineers was a game, obviously, we, we introduced uh, last week on the podcast, uh, and I named it as uh, basically one of my favorite games that I've ever played. And as such, sort of got the interest of, of some other members of this podcast, uh, Simon in particular, because he was forced to, obviously, he's playing uh, reviewing games with me this this week. <laughs> and I suddenly realised, as soon as we finished recording that podcast, that actually I was quite nervous, because this is, uh, I hold this game in extremely high esteem. However, I am aware of its many, many flaws as well, which you have to look past uh, to actually enjoy. Um, the, the game itself, uh, we did explain last week, but just to give you sort of a brief overview of it, it's a sandbox game uh, which revolves basically around engineering and construction. There's an exploration element as well, so you do explore the planet that you're on, explore space, um, and there's also a survival element, so you need to make sure that your suit is topped up with energy and that you've got enough oxygen to breathe and that sort of stuff. It is extremely big. Uh, there are absolutely no loading screens in it whatsoever, apart from obviously originally loading into the world, but you can fly from Earth all the way to the outer planets, Mars, and and even further than that, without encountering a single loading screen, which I think is amazing. And we've been playing survival in particular. There are various um, game modes, so you can play creative where there's no survival element and you just build what you want. We've been playing survival, which basically has you mining for the resources you need and building bigger ships, more effective ships, basically for mining more effectively, which allows you to build bigger things, which allows you to explore further and safer and and more and more safely yes yeah, yeah absolutely I, I i'm gonna hand things over to you in a moment simon because I, I would be really interested to get your perspective on it this week but before i do i've had a great deal of fun playing it this week however i have very very nearly rage quit and just said that's it i'm not playing any more of it uh, on at least five occasions within a fortnight <laughs> oh my goodness frankly i can't believe you've managed to play it five occasions this fortnight based on the amount of art that has also oh, been well played. you'd be surprised at the times that rob rob elects to start playing space engineer yeah i'm a, i'm an early riser so uh, I, I tend to be up sort of before six to get in a little bit before work you see that's that's the key so give us just give, give us a brief overview of, of what you thought of it this week, mate. So I don't think we'll, we're uh, I'm comfortable calling this a review at this point because, as you kind of mentioned, this game is vast and it is deep in a way that I didn't even realize existed. Like the amount of physics and systems and stuff that they've built into this game is is incredible. So you, not only do you have to in, in the survival mode you're you're sort of mining, collecting and refining the things that you've mined to turn them into more tools and weapons and and other blocks that help you then create bigger and bigger ships, but you you need to take into account things like does this ship have enough thrust to stay in the air if you're building a mining ship does it have enough cargo containers to hold all of the things that you're mining and then when it's full of ore can you, can you still take off for example the the kind of physics and stuff of it is is what i think really sets it apart i've watched so many youtube videos in the last 2 weeks about this game and every single one has just kind of left my jaw on the floor with what people have come up with. Has anyone come up with anything resembling a reconstruction of Minas Tirith? Because based <laughs> on the anecdote from last episode where Sam said this is the reason that he stopped playing Minecraft, I'd really like to know... I anticipated this question like and I 
was thinking about the the issue being that that Sam wanted to build uh, Helm's Deep and then have a, a working a working uh, <laughs> working river coming out of the the gate. And as far as I can tell, there is no flowing water in in uh, Space Engineers. It's oh. all it's all frozen ice. That being said, I have absolutely no doubt that you could build a working replica of of Helm's Deep if you so desired. And to be honest with you, I think that would be almost trivially simple in comparison to the things that you can build because not only does this game let you like place down blocks that then link together and then you can strap a thruster on them and that'll that'll take you into space but you get things like pistons and rotators and automatic welders and things like that if you just load up the game when you're on the menu that's sort of like new game load game etc they play like a b-roll of things that that you can build in the game and uh, honestly there's one one bit of it where it's like a 3d printer that someone's built from the blocks in the game (laughs) that will then build a ship and i've just sat there like i can barely rub two bits of stone together to turn it into a small block and and yet this game has the sandbox potential for things like that i mean it's honest it's honestly incredible to, to give you a little bit of an idea, I suppose, of how deep the game goes in terms of engineering, um, one of the things you have to do pretty early on is build yourself a truck so that you can go and mine resources um, at source. So you can mine stone and turn them into some of the resources you need, but you've also got ore deposits, which give you far more concentrated versions of the of the thing you need, and you get far more stuff from it. But they might not be anywhere near where you you know your yeah. your base has been set up or your your you know your ship has landed. So you you have to exactly. travel out to find them. Yeah. So you you build yourself a truck generally, which is the first place to start. Um, and I went mining with Sai, and we went down to this ice lake, which had the ore that we needed in it. Now the way that we built this truck meant that it was very lopsided, so um, all of the cargo containers were on one side of it, and all the seats were on the other, which meant that when we were loading this thing up with ore, it was starting to list quite dangerously and risk sort of toppling over because uh, all the weight was on one side. So what I had to do is get Sai to sit in the truck while I loaded it up and he could then manually balance the suspension on this truck to make sure that it was it was flat again for when we drove off. And th- that's the sort of thing I mean, I suppose. It's not just a matter of I'm going to bolt a suspension onto this. It's about I'm going to bolt a suspension onto this and then play around with the little settings to make sure that the suspension rides at the right height, to make sure that the wheels attach at the right point, to make sure that the speed is right. Uh, and, and that's how deep it goes you i'm know, not gonna you, lie though that sounds too deep that sounds like i'm really sorry about that. that does sound a bit dull if i wanted to do that i'd become a mechanic i can absolutely understand why when we tell a story like that you would think that but when you're playing the game and you're looking at this ship that you or this rover that you've spent you know time and effort and resources in building and you're both stood there going yeah, that thing's going to flip over. And understand that when it flips over, it will destroy itself because yeah. it all takes, like, you take damage. That It has a, a physics system to allow for, for things crashing into other things and damage to all of them. To then go on and go, do you know, I'm, I, I saw on a YouTube video that you can actually tweak the suspension to make it a bit tighter or make it a bit looser so that it will even itself out. And then you go in and you do it and then you kind of victoriously ride back to your base with a yeah, huge deposit of cobalt and and a working rover that hasn't you know ripped itself in half during that it's weirdly satisfying so it takes a long time to achieve anything i don't think i don't think that's fair to say i don't think it takes a long time but the essence of the game is all about improving your efficiency so in that example uh me and rob drove to the lake we both then had to get out the car and manually with as our players go and do that mining and then put it into the into the car and drive back now we got the resources we needed and we had like fun doing it but that's that's uh you know quite a long roundabout way of doing it so what i've done since then is built a ship that has a big mining rig on the front of it and has a big load of cargo boxes on the back of it and you can connect them all up together using pipes and so now when the drill drills and and does the mining all of the stuff that you mine automatically goes through these pipes into the the big box or you know the big storage container and then i can fly the ship back to our sort of base of operations connect it onto our base and then all of the machines and stuff that use that ore can automatically grab everything from the ship and use it to then build 
you know more uh, more of the resources that we need i i would like to speak a little bit about the negative parts of this game which actually i'm really uh, apprehensive about doing because i just wanted to. to come on here <laughs> yeah. and just say this is just an amazing game buy it and enjoy it um i've had probably some of the most frustrating experiences playing this game over the last fortnight and that is almost entirely centered around uh, using multiplayer servers uh, which I just think are um, absolutely unforgivingly bad. First of all, we both logged in. And just to sort of loop back a little bit, Claire, when you said that it takes quite a long time to do anything, I would actually a- agree with that. Certainly at the beginning of the game, I th- yeah, I think set up. When you start, yeah, it's a lot of just mm. mining to, to just try and get the basic stuff set up. And that does yeah. take a while, especially on your own. which Particularly when you don't know what you're doing. Yes. Um, and yeah, I'd say you're probably talking a good sort of three hours to get established and to get to a point where, you know, you've got your rover, you, you, you can sort of go off on more exploration. I have done at least five brand new starts this week because either the server crashed and everything fell through the ground into the center of the earth and I lost it all. That was heartbreaking when that happened. That, that for me was, was very, very nearly game breaking. However, to counteract that, I would go to bed at night fuming, absolutely furious, <laughs> and then wake up at five o'clock in the morning and start again because it's that addictive. And actually, one of the reasons why I'm not very prepared for this podcast is because I was playing it this morning. It is incredibly, incredibly addictive. Uh, and once you learn it and once you get it right, I, I think tremendous fun. So uh, £15.50 on Steam at the moment, chaps. Three and a half pints or so. Worth it? Absolutely. 100%, yeah. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Tiny Table Talks. No, 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 don't cry. Don't ponder whether there is still good in the world. We will be back in two weeks' time with some more game reviews and some more whimsical chatter. If you'd like to get in touch about anything you've heard today or would like to suggest a game you would like to hear us review, then please either tweet us at tinytablepod or email us at thetinytables at gmail.com. We hope to see you in a fortnight for a Middle Earth card game, a delve into the world of tower defence, and of course, an update on that very tiniest of tables.